Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing well. So today I am going to be doing a little bit of a combination of a reading wrap up for the first half of August and also a currently reading video because uh, truth be told I've not done that much reading in August or at least I've just not finished that many books in August. I'm not entirely sure why that is the case. I think maybe I've been filming a lot for booktube and in the process have just not finished that many books. I think also like I started on quite a big book and I'm still like plowing my way through that um, and also I've not been listening to audiobooks really in the first half of the month. I basically decided to binge uh, from the beginning one of my old favourite podcasts. So that's where my uh, time has been spent. I put my Scribd subscription on hold for a month whilst I did that. So I'm going to start off by showing you the books that I've read in the first half of the month and to be honest I'm just going to show you everything that I finished uh, so far in this month because it's three books uh, so I'm not going to be quite as pernickety about having to uh, just talk about the books that I read up to the 15th of the month. We're, we're just going to talk about everything because there's not a lot to talk about today. <laughs> so first off you'll probably have seen in my finish the thorn video that the big goal uh, was to read A Fine Balance by Rahinton Mystery that month uh, which really puts into perspective how little I have read this month because I finished this on the 2nd of August. This book takes place primarily in the mid 1970s in India during the emergency. This this was a political event in which the Prime Minister Indira Ghani declared a state of emergency in the country and basically uh, ruled by decree. It was a very controversial period of history in India. Basically a lot of civil liberties were stripped, elections were called off, there was a lot of censorship of the press um, and basically there were a lot of atrocities that occurred during this time including uh, mass sterilisation campaigns. I'm not going to go too too into the history surrounding this because it's something that I'm not particularly educated on. A lot of it was basically I would read a passage in this and then google. Uh, it's not something I am educated and well versed in so I'm not gonna go too much because I don't want there to be like a whole you've got this wrong thing going on in the comment section. You know I am I'm very much ignorant of this history. And it mainly follows the lives of four different characters as they kind of converge uh, in the middle of this book. Though I would say if there is a main character it is Deanda Dalal who we meet I think in her mid to late 40s. She's been widowed for quite a few years and is constantly trying to find ways of bringing some extra income into her home so that she doesn't have to go back and live with her quite abusive brother. And she basically sets up this quite illegal uh, sewing ring in her house made up of two seamstresses, two tailors who make these pattern clothes to order which she then sends off to a larger company. However she knows that she is not allowed to do this as part of her tenancy agreements and I feel like a lot of humour came from Dina's uh, attitude to dealing with her landlord every single time that he would come up and be like I feel like you're doing something illegal here she'd be like how dare you how dare you come into my house and accuse me of all of these things get out get out of my house and I just found it really funny and I feel like those moments of hilarity were really really needed in this book because it is it is very very bleak I think something that you would very much need to know going into this book is that it is very very bleak and very 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 violent this book really does not shy away from gore, uh, from sexual violence, from like physical fighting violence. I don't know if that was the right way to phrase that but you know what I mean. All of this which is going on around the lives of these four main characters. You really get this sense of how people's day-to-day -day lives are really being disrupted by this political event and the violence that is going on around them and I feel like this title of A Fine Balance is really echoing this idea of you, you just do not know what is going to happen to you next. The ways in which people's lives and their happiness are really dictated by random chance. So many events that occur in this book are really just due to happenstance of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, of going down an alleyway that they shouldn't have taken at that particular moment. I spent a lot of time reading this book just like looking out of the corner of my eye like no don't do it. At the same time you are getting a, a pretty good character study into these four different people's lives and the context of what is going on around them and the community around them. I felt actually like reading Middlemarch prior to reading this was quite good prep because uh, Middlemarch is this idea of the, the study of provincial life and I feel like in many ways this kind of echoes that. It is very much about day-to-day -day lives being disrupted by this big political event. But because it is focused on day-to-day -day lives it can at many times feel a little bit slow. I did think at some points like it was a little bit too long um, and 
I think especially like Dina's life I was really interested by especially her early life and how she got to where she was um but then there were other characters who we really delved into their backstory and the village that they grew up in and I was just like I don't think I need this necessarily but like I say Middlemarch was a really good primer to just getting into that mindset and really kind of having acquired the taste for that kind of writing. I thought this was an interesting book I'm really really glad that I did read it however I, I wouldn't necessarily say that I found it enjoyable at all. I wasn't desperate to know what happened. Every single time I read it I was like oh that is very very interesting but it wasn't an enjoyable experience. Another thing that I would say is that I didn't love the ending. I thought the ending, uh, something happens basically in the last couple of pages which to me felt a little bit out of character. A character does something and it felt a bit manipulative to me. It felt as if Written to Mystery was really trying to evoke a strong emotion out of the reader by doing this thing that just felt out of character. And I've seen other people discuss this ending and kind of explain why uh, it was that this character did what they did. And I, I, it just, it still just felt like it was manipulative to me. So I didn't love that. I'd probably give this like three stars in terms of actual enjoyment. I think in terms of writing uh, and the message, it is much higher, but in terms of whether or not I would reread it again, is it a favorite? Not really for me, but glad that I read it. Next up this month I read Axiom's End by Lindsay Ellis. This is a sci-fi taking place in the year 2000. We are following the main character Cora Sabino whose father has basically become this whistleblower who has declared to the American public how there has been an alien presence on Earth which the government has been keeping a secret. Cora has had a lot of attention put on her family as a result and she's really just trying to stay out of it. However one night she ends up having an encounter with one of these aliens and he injects her with something which basically gives her the ability to understand this alien's language and is therefore able to be an intermediary and a translator between humans and aliens. As I've said in the past, um, I'm a big fan of Lindsay Ellis's YouTube videos. So this was, even though this was not my typical genre, it's not my typical read, I was really, really excited for this. And I'll be on very, very honest with you. I think had I not been reading this knowing it was somebody that I love from YouTube already, I might have put it down within the first hundred pages. I feel like it took a little while for this book to get going. However, once I did get through that first 100 pages, I did race through it. I found it really, really enjoyable. It's a book that's really focusing on this idea of truth, like a phrase that is repeated over and over again is truth is a human right. And also delving into this topic of what would happen if we did meet an alien species. Is there any way that we'd be able to coexist peacefully? And uh, the, main, the main alien that we meet uh, comes from a culture in which this, they know, is inevitably not going to be the case. There is always going to be conflict when species intermix. That because a species is always trying to fit an other into a framework that they understand, you will always inherently end up misrepresenting things. That there is always a limit to how far you can truly understand an other. Which really fits in with what the main character is doing as a translator. This theme of there is always going to be something that is lost in translation. And it's really delving into this idea of like, what do we do? when we inherently cannot understand another. Is there a way to peacefully coexist or is it always going to lead to some sort of genocide? Obviously because I am not a big sci-fi reader I have never read a book about first contact. In fact I cannot remember the last time I read a book about aliens and aliens and humans trying to coexist together. In fact like when was the last alien book I read? Honestly, I think the last time I read a book about aliens was reading The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and basically their uh, their interaction with humans was basically to destroy the planet. So yeah, I, I don't, I genuinely don't think I've ever read a book where humans and aliens interact. Hmm. Um, so yeah, because of that, I cannot say how much of this is a unique concept to this book. I can literally just talk from my personal enjoyment of this book, which was fairly high. I think some things which might hinder other people's enjoyment is the setting. It is set in 2007 and as a result you have a lot of pop culture references peppered throughout, which was something that I was kind of expecting, you know, like I follow Lindsay Ellis and if you've ever watched her videos you'll know that her reviews are often laden with other pop culture references, so I knew that that was coming going into it but I know might put some people off. I've seen quite a few people saying that they weren't really a big fan of the main character Cora. I didn't really have any issues with Cora. I think people found her a bit dislikable because she is, 
not passive, but she doesn't want to be involved in a lot of it. I don't know, I didn't really have an issue with her. I thought she was a very believable character and she was somebody who didn't want to be in this situation being forced into it. And I thought, you know, any gr gripes that she might have with this were completely understandable. And I'm really interested in seeing how she grows uh, from this book onwards. I also know from watching uh, Murphy Napier's videos that there were some repetitive phrases in here and I, I feel like I probably would have picked up on without having seen that review first but yeah there were some repetitive phrases which I think hopefully um, Lindsay will probably grow out of in later books. Repeated references to Cora's lizard brain and also uh, one that I picked up on a lot was um, her saying Cora all but insert thing here. For example, like Cora all but fainted and, and it, she would just describe things in that kind of way. I have to say my favourite pop culture reference in this whole book uh, was when Cora was eating a plate of pancakes and she looks down and she realises, I ate the whole plate. The whole plate. <laughs> and if you haven't watched Lindsay you will not get that but if you have, y you know, you, you know, you see, you see. And then the last thing that I've read this month so far has been this little Faber collection of Percy Bysshe Shelley. I think I've mentioned in the past that I've been very much influenced by Jennifer from Jennifer Brooks uh, into reading Romantic Outlaws and I know she's also gotten very much into the Romantic Poets since then. Uh, so I did eventually pick up a little poetry collection. I've actually finished this before I finished Romantic Outlaws. <laughs> I think that's just the perk of poetry usually being a lot shorter than big old biographies. But I feel like this has been really nice to read alongside Romantic Outlaws um, and I would say I, I find it hard to kind of rate poetry um, because it's kind of like short story collections or anthologies. I feel like there's always going to be some things that you latch on more than others. I don't think from what I've read so far of Shelley that he's going to be a favourite poet of all time but there are some really really beautiful poems in here and you kind of feel like it's a real shame that he died so young because there's so much so much in here and I'd have loved to see how he might have matured. There were some poems in here where I was just like oh you can tell that this is written by such a little privileged boy. <laughs> One poem title which I found absolutely hilarious was called Stanzas Written in Dejection Near Naples, which just to me just seems like the ultimate like gap year poetry. Like, I am heartbroken, my life is over, woe is me, but at least I'm in Naples. That poem has this whole idea of your inner life being horrible, but at least your surroundings, your external surroundings are lovely. <laughs> I think my favourite poem in this was uh, called Mutual Ability. We are as clouds that veil the midnight moon, how restlessly they speed and gleam and quiver, streaking the darkness radiantly. Yet soon night closes round, and they are lost forever. Or like forgotten lyres whose dissonant strings give various response to each varying blast, to whose frail frame no second motion brings, one mood or modulation like the last. We rest a dream has power to poison sleep. We rise, one wandering thought pollutes the day. We feel, conceive or reason, laugh or weep, embrace fond foe or cast our cares away. It is the same. For be it joy or sorrow, the path of its departure still is free. Man's yesterday may ne'er be like his morrow. Nought may endure but mutual ability. This concept of mutual ability, the fact that things are always liable to change, um, and I just think this poem is so gorgeous. You can tell that I focused on history and not on English literature because I cannot like delve very very deeply into these poems but I, I, I just know that I liked them. Is that is that enough? Is that enough? So yes that is my short little wrap up of the three books that I have finished so far uh, in August. Now on to what I am currently reading. As I've mentioned I have been reading Romantic Outlaws, The Extraordinary Lives of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley by Charlotte Gordon and I'm, I'm really really enjoying what I'm reading from this but <laughs> I'm not really that far into it. I don't know if it's literally just the size of this intimidates me so I kind of have put off picking it up and I don't know why because every single time I'm reading this I'm finding it so delightful. Like I can tell that this is a five star book but I'm just not picking it up. This to me is just such an enjoyable, readable biography. I don't think you need to have much knowledge of Mary Wollstonecraft or Mary Shelley going into it and it in many ways reads like fiction. So I just need to buckle down and read this because <laughs> I know I'm gonna like it. I'm also currently listening to Queens of the Conquest, The Extraordinary Women Who Changed the Course of English History 1066 to 1167 by Alison Weir. This is the first book in Alison Weir's England's Medieval Queens series. Uh, the next book, Queens of the Crusades, is coming out in November, I believe. 
believe. This instalment chronicles the lives of Matilda of Flanders, Matilda of Scotland, Adeliza of Louvain, uh, Empress Matilda, or she is called Empress Maud in here, and Matilda of Boulogne. So yes, you can probably already tell I'm excited by this because Empress Matilda is going to make another feature. <laughs> It'll be very interesting to see Alison Weir's take on her. I feel like she's not going to get quite as much coverage because, you know, she wasn't a, an official queen. I'm also interested to learn a little bit more about Matilda of Boulogne, who was Stephen's wife. She obviously featured in the Empress Matilda biography, but I'd love to get a little bit more into her life because I, I, I feel like she was the brains behind the operation in many ways. I mean, Stephen got captured and it was up to Matilda of Boulogne to get him free, so... Who, who's, who's the brain there? Who's the brain? I'm currently up to Matilda of Scotland, so the second of the queens here, and I'm really, really enjoying this so far. And if you are wanting to get a little bit of a whistle-stop tour into different medieval queens, then this I would already recommend as a place to go. Um, I would also recommend uh, the Queens of England podcast. It is a podcast that is no longer running, but the episodes are still all out there. It's an old podcast that was hosted by James Bolton. I believe he now does one called The Other Half, which is also focused on women of history. But I really, really loved the Queens of England podcast. It was one that really got me into uh, the medieval and early modern queens. But anyway, yes, that is it uh, for the books that I have read so far and what I am currently reading. Uh, please let me know what you are currently reading. Uh, let me know any books that you finished, uh, any thoughts that you have on the books that I read this month. I'd love to hear from you. I hope that you are having a fantastic, fantastic day and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks.